Aaron here. We didn't plan this or anything, but you know, I was just thinking he's the one that brought us from DDA to DIA here at the resource and did, and I wasn't By here. Following Brian Searle's work. Well, that's right. He's going to give credit to Brian Searle because that's what he always starts with. This is not him. This is this is stuff in there. So go ahead. Uh, right, tell us about your biggest challenge to using DIA. Yeah, discerning the reliability. I mean, with by by drinking from the fire hose, you're going to see a lot of truths and a lot of things that look like truths. And and being able to discern the reliable representations of quantity from the unreliable representations of quantity uh, is where the challenge is. Because I mean, you, you can these data sets can provide the most direct measurement of a disease as you can get, given that proteins drive disease, and and you know truth is stranger than fiction. So sometimes the patterns can can line up in ways that are hard to write off. So being able to know whether any given quantity is a reliable representation of that quantity. Uh, is really valuable. It's really good to know. I mean, it, it could make the difference in our understanding of disease. It, 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 to me, it's the biggest challenge. So, and, and we have ways of, of doing that for, for scoring the identity of a, of a peptide, sort of, um, that have been adapted from uh, uh, bottom-up, or sorry, uh, spectrum-centric approaches. But do we, uh, I, I'm not sure if there's a, a score that tells you that this quantity, how reliable is this quantity? And I'm not sure you're going to get it. You're not going to see advertisements for a software that offers a thousand more unreliable quantities. But being able to know the likelihood of this being a good, you know, bet, to me is is a big challenge in in um, in DIA is knowing the reliability of any given quantity in that data set because you could there's a lot of good data in there that you could feed to an you know an LLM and then just ask it what the hell's going on, but you have to know which data, which quantities are right. Uh, but that being said, you know, I'll, I'll, um, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what everyone else's challenges are. What do you think, Dennis? I, 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 I don't believe, I believe your biggest challenge was Rick. Uh, no matter what you say, I, I, I can't believe that wasn't your biggest challenge trying to get DIA to work. <laughs> Uh, not, uh, you know, Aaron's going to be the only one that believes this, but, uh, uh you know, I, I, I essentially gave him the charge to, Hey, I think we need to do this. And I think, I don't know, I couldn't, couldn't really tell if he thought I was joking or not, but, but, uh, it was a 2019 Cubo meeting in Australia that convinced me, you know, I think, I, I think we can, I think we should try this. Um, and it, for me, it was, it was a realization of of looking at these complicated spectra that you can't interpret because there's there's just looks like noise and realizing that the only difference between that and an and an MRM um would be you know an MRM is going to take the the third quadrupole and look at one mass in that spectrum and measure that and be blind to everything else and now we have the ability to measure everything else and go back individually and do that in silico MRM. And that's a, you know, simple concept that I just didn't get uh, in looking at it. Um, but yeah, I, all the I think features lag behind a bit, but yeah, yeah. Building it out from the targeted workflow. It, it, it is. And, and the, and I think the software, um, you know, I think, I think we, we hit it about right. I mean, we started in, in t January of 2020. Yeah, we got uh, lucky. Yeah. And, and the, the software was just, you know, just kind of there, the instruments as we, as we've shown, right. I mean, the QEs are capable of doing it um, in, you know, I don't know when the first QE come out 2014, something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they, they essentially were good enough to do it then and, and QTOFs probably before that. So we just didn't know it. Yeah. Uh, but and I, th I think knowing knowing where to draw the line in yeah. quantitation, where to be comfortable, where not to be, and that that right. probably is not just DIA; it's everything. Um, yeah. But it's, it's worse on DIA thing. because it's harder to look at. Yeah, yeah, and I do want to give some credit to uh, Encyclopedia because they 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 more or less encapsulated an algorithm for transition refinement that otherwise you have to do in Skyline. Uh, so they they really took a lion's share of work out of 
turning a not so great DIA analysis into a decent DIA analysis where the signal noise, you know, there's a lot more true quantities in your data than false quantities. So I mean, they, they really, you know, made that process of, of um, I guess, building in your, 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 uh, uh, your validation, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I think if you, if you look at the output, the encyclopedia or your know, scaffold DIA output is, is likely going to give you less wrong answers. If that's your output, it's going to give you less wrong answers than Spectrum or Diane. Um, right, and, I, true. and I think, right. And, and so I think they would probably argue, uh, you know, Brian Searle and, and Mike McCoss would argue that, that if you get a longer list, you're getting a, you might be getting a longer list of, of real differences, but you're definitely getting a longer list of spurious differences. And I, I you know, I, but am I going to do encyclopedia or do DIA and take the longer list? I'm probably going to take the longer list, right? Complain That's about great. it, but I'll probably do it. Yeah. So, are you guys suggesting that the that the biggest challenge in DIA is 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 do you err on the side of giving spurious, as you said, spurious results that the biologist then tracks down and spends a month looking at and going, yeah, that's not a thing, or do you uh, err yes. on the side of giving up a, a more uh, conservative list that you're much more confident in? It, sometimes it's hard to even tell where where you are on that conservative list, right? So, I mean, a, a data point's coming to mind in one of the data sets you showed yesterday, there was one data point that was out at like a tenfold change. Well, that's, you know, and 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 very significant. Well, clearly that's the, the one you go after, right? I mean, it's a tenfold change, except that data point was missing on the other analysis. So what does that mean, right? I mean, ah. I think we're just going to commiserate and complain here, but I, I don't know, I, you know, I, I, how do you do that? When we first got Spectronaut, I thought, okay, I'm going to look through and I'm going to find a, an intensity level that I feel comfortable with, you know, and it's going to be 10 to the five or 10 to the four or 10 to the three, you know, whatever. There's going to be some noise level that, that I'm not going to be believed below and I'm just going to set a threshold and look above that. And and you can't do it because you look in you know in some regions of the spectra, you can have a signal that's you know five times ten to the three and man it looks great, and another part of the spectra you can have one times ten to the six it looks like noise. And so like okay well I can't do that uh, what do I do and so far I haven't done anything. <laughs> one question is this after you do the pro the program of di Diane. Yeah. Because yeah. you do the DIA and then you do the analysis. Do you well, not have an is... idea which are the more significant? Uh, if you were to validate, could that program help you to select the most? D Diane can't important because you can't protein. visualize the data. So I'm talking about looking at Spectronaut data, but it's similar to Diane, right? The Spectronaut's gonna gonna analyze it the similar way, but it has a viewer that you can actually look at the transitions. Okay. You can look at a peptide, look at the fragments. Um, with Diane, you have to go on faith because you can't visualize it. Um, I guess. In but theory, it gives you the you can, statistics to determine the fold change. You, know, you, you can get a fold change, right? So it's going to give you it's going to give you a fold change and a p value, but but something is causing the program to to spit out a number, a quantitative number. I like looking at the spectra. And and saying is is that a reasonable output for for how this spectra looks? Mm. Uh, and you can't do that on everything. But if you know if it's my research and I'm the one that's going to make the knockout, which is really funny to think of me doing anything with like a biological knockout. But if I'm going to be the one that does that, I I want to have confidence that the the information behind the volcano plot is is real data and in other words you, you go uh target it you go to look at the spectra and find i'm just talking about it, looking at the raw data that generated yeah. the, the raw dia data no data yeah. 
Yeah. Something to test the hypothesis that has been generated from this discovery experiment. Yeah. Was was Diane? Uh, so because you cannot visualize that. So what is um, a valid mechanism to validate, like to confirm? Um, I don't know. Yeah, multiple points. <laughs> Uh, IHC, IF, and uh, electron microscopy here. But, but I would also argue that, you know, if you are prompted, you can take a deeper dive into their data. And, you know, in some ways, I I don't, I, I almost wonder sometimes if we're not going too far down the interpretation line for them. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're perhaps a slightly more raw uh, output to them will, and, and, you know, we don't want to talk about, talk with them over and over and over, you know, and, and Stephanie, I'm sure this hits her harder than anybody, but, um, you know, on the one hand, we would like a project to be done. We can turn the page. We can take it off the Monday board. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, if if they are considering a knockout mouse, I would love to hear about it. and just to, you know, for that opportunity to 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 make sure that you know the the data, if it's based on our data, that that the basis is as strong as as that would would need to to take that step. Um, I, I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, sometimes I lose track. I always kind of sometimes warn people when they come into my office, they have a bunch of analytical chemistry papers and they want to do that. And I said, well, you know, I sure would love to see one of those app an application paper, you know, where someone's actually used this. And I think it'll be interesting. It would be interesting to, to see where DIA starts to end up in, you know, JBC and, you know, some of the other more, you know, more applications papers as opposed to circling in this world of E. coli prep versus a human prep versus a yeast prep showing that we get the expected ratios um, because I think it'd be, you know, that's a big step for, for, tech, for new techniques. Yeah, so... I don't know what Dennis is showing there. Oh, that's that's Stephanie. She's just uh, showing what we were talking about as far as uh, you know validating. So, this is the question: is you know, is this uh, particular? Because uh, if you're looking at results and you're looking at a volcano plot, uh, it's not really showing you what these transitions look like. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we're saying is that there's and we don't we can't define it yet we don't say well it's not an it's not based on intensity but there's when you see one maybe it's the number of points across the peak but really it has to do with how much do i believe that that this one right here looks look doesn't look so good I, i'm not sure i'd want to write a well, paper can, on that guy that's my patent right there <laughs> Yeah. But that's what I like about Spectronize. You can actually start to look at some of this with Diane. You can't unless you build your own. But you can with, with Scaffold DIA. With DIA. You know, Scaffold DIA, you can do the same thing. And uh, I don't know what the price point difference is between and, Spectronaut and. Aaron, you may know this. Um, I, I, I've at least heard people talk about taking Diane output into Skyline. Yeah. I, I'm so bad at Skyline that I haven't tried. I think we did it a, a, enough versions ago that it's now easier. Uh, it may be doable. Um, something about the, the library um, from Diane is now importable into um, Skyline. That one. We just have to get Andy to volunteer his <laughs> bioinformatics people to make us a Diane viewer. That's the goal of the rest of the afternoon. That's what we were discussing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to work with them. <laughs> I mean, look at that. Of course, they're saying it's not identified in the red, but you see the force for the grass. That's not great either. So, but yeah. Maybe we'll just, we'll just steal you. You know, I'll tell Alan. You know, <laughs> come to work for us. 
And that's a little of the confusion, though, is how many of those peptides go into the final result is right. you know, a little bit of what we talked about yesterday was we don't really know. Um, yeah, so the report gives you a lot of options in here. Um, and I tend to export way more than the end user needs because I'm looking at CV values. I'm looking at precursors. They do have a, a new one that I found, number of precursors identified. Um, so there's a lot more information you can actually export out of this that I'm still trying to figure out how it could be useful for the downstream filtering. I like to find something that's like gonna make it more of a real outcome. So there, yeah, I'm still playing around with this. If anybody's got the, suggestions. The Cafoldia Academic is 9,995. Yeah. For the Scaffoldia yeah. yeah. For Academic is 9,995. So it's a, yeah. it's is that a year? Um no, well, or just I think Sora is for uh, the license forever. The only thing that you need to do then, if you wanted to get upgrade, you need to have a contract. I guess. It's actually be the same thing. I think that's so right. I, I will add that Scaffold DIA is based on the software Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia DIA, which is an open source Java program that can be uh, downloaded and run for free. But as someone who's made a living off of getting software to work, I would still say that getting using Scaffold DIA might be the right way to go, uh, even though that you, you can try Scaffold or you can try Encyclopedia for free. It's it is a lot of command line uh, rigmarole. But but if you want to go that route, it's it's there. So, so does anybody else have a challenge or is this the challenge? I mean, we've talked about administration. We've talked about buy-in from our users. We've talked about instrumentation, but. Um, what about the sample prep? I, yeah, I, I think data normalization is a is an issue. And we talk about this in our lab with, um, when we do TMT, it's really nice because we have a, uh, we do a ratio check and, you know, label all the channels individually, mix a small portion and, and we, we should get the same, you know, median intensity across all of them. If we don't, we, we add a little more or a little less of each channel so that we're, we're starting with a pretty good normalized mixture and it makes normalization easier for bioinformatics and for the data analysis that they're all kind of starting at the same point. For DIA, we do a protein quant on most all the samples uh, if it's serum, we don't, we just go on volume, but, uh, there's, you know, there's variability there and, you know, it's, it, it's difficult to, to expect consistent results. If you, if you know that there's some variability in the amount of protein you're loading. And so I, I, I don't see people talk about that enough. I mean, the people I see talk about it, say they do nano drop. And so I, I stopped listening. <laughs> so... <laughs> And those of you who don't know, nan nanodrops, a, it's a, a little UV detector thing that you can put a microliter of liquid on. And if, if you have one, Andy and I can send you ours, and that way you can have three. So, Yeah, so so that was my question to you. Is is peptide quantitation on a nanodrop just not it, it, believable? It, no, it, it can be good if there's nothing else in there that absorbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because everything absorbs uh, but, that. But if there's a whatever. contaminant that absorbs, then it's you, you're not going to measure peptide. You're going to measure yeah. whatever that contaminant is. Mm -hmm. And you know if you if your samples are consistent, you know if you're doing cell culture, uh, you know 96 well plates and looking at different chemo drugs and and doing lots of things that's kind of a similar, you know, similar experiment, it'll probably work great for you because you would you know whatever your background is is likely going to be the same in all of them and so it's going to be pretty consistent for us getting tissue that's brain or liver or you know mosquito eyelashes or whatever it's uh it, it's it's going to be too variable but when when, when, when you're using nano drop you don't use it tonight you use a vca when you measure in nano drop, for example, you should not measure some complex mixture at 290. You need to use a VCA because at 290, you can also whatever it is over there. 
Yeah, but I mean the nano because many people are taking whole whole cell like say and they try to measure nano drop directly. No, I mean most people do. I think doing nano drop are probably doing it at the peptide level, but I guess you could I mean you could do it at the protein. But yeah, our nano drop has a, a peptide. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think it's an A210. No, but or so many people are using for complex mixture, and you are absorbing an A290. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're working with ESA, probably could you have better and complex mixture because at 290 you can get a whatever chunk yeah. can be over there. And I'm also working at it with you analytical flow 45. right now, which is the protein we need to even do something is so high that background comparison is lower. And but yeah, yeah. I mean, so. Right now we do, so what we do and, and, but going forward, it's not a, a, because right now our DIA pipeline is so it's not our primary workflow. Right. So we, so we take like 5% and do like a 20 minute run. Yeah. So, you know, um, so if you have 20 samples, you know, you spend yeah. half a day or a day to get it in line and, and that that's how we do our normalization and, and that works well. But I mean, moving forward, thinking about a high throughput, core facility with a primarily DIA workflow, you, you can't do that, right? I mean, to me, that's the, that's the only, that's the best way that we've come up with it now, but yeah. it's not a, it's not a fast way and it's not an efficient way, but there, yeah, like we, I said, we've tried, you know, nano drop all that. None of that really works. I, all, all I really trust is the mass spec data, but that means pretty quantitative. Yeah. But, but that's, we but talk about do doing that. that with our Tim's <laughs> yeah. doing the five minute runs. It's like, yeah. that's an expensive peptide quant machine, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, if we could get it to run reliably. Yeah. Uh, but, at, you know, in, in a high flow setting, you know, with the, the high flow source right. running a five minute gradient. Yeah. Exactly. And, and who knows? Maybe that's what we end up doing with one of our fusions. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. May, it may be the only, I mean, yeah. it's the only solution that we've thought of at this yeah. point that actually is, you know, yeah, works. So, I mean, Dennis, you want to give the spill the beans on what we do with, with DIA? Like, you know, what our, what our quant is? Uh, I would if I knew what what, what is our quant? No, I mean we, you know we run it, and if it looks bad, then we inject more, right? I mean, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so I run a test run, and I'm um, sort of shooting. You know, I'm assuming that sample prep has given me samples that are all prepped, starting with the same protein concentration. So therefore, I have the same peptides. You know, fantasy. I'm sorry. Wake up. Right. Um, and so then I'll run one, and uh, to kind of get the load level, so that it. I get so I'm, there's sort of a magic yeah. just yeah. cherry pick. Yeah, we yeah. Cherry magic pick one and go, okay, tick. hopefully yeah. this is the range. And, and yeah, that, and then and I and then we that's run what that. we do. I mean yeah. it's, 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 yeah. And then when you're talking about high throughput, so um what I choose is probably not gonna get me the maximum number of peptides, but if I were to choose the maximum, I'm changing out columns a lot. I'm you know, <laughs> get a lot of clogging because I am like pushing the envelope. So I back off just a just a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that yeah, so that, that that we can be more high throughput. And so, you know, that's uh, but but what uh, one of the one of the um, surprising um, corollaries to that is by backing that off a little bit. Our CVs are much tighter. Our 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 in group variability looks a lot better. Because when you are throwing everything yeah. at the kitchen sink at the mass spectrometer at the same time, it's, it's, there's, yeah. Yeah. And so it, that, that helped uh, uh, a lot there. So, you know, just sort of taking that pressure off myself and saying, okay, I'm not going to try to get the maximum number every time. Um, instead, we're going to try to get something that's more sustainable. I want to ask you one question about uh, before you send the, uh, your data sheet to the Diane. Do you have any approach you can clean up the data, raw data? No. So we're just sending all the raw data. We're not doing any trimming or anything. Yeah, I mean, so maybe we, before this, I can, you know, set up, clean up line and then cut off some. No. Yeah. Which means if we're running, yeah, uh, you know, like every time we run gel bands, though we don't do a lot of DIA on gel bands, there's always this Kamasi junk that comes out at the front there and you know there's 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 detergents that are coming off at the end and undigested protein or whatever other stuff there were yeah master question yeah just yeah. a pretty new question so i heard many times that you don't use tmt labeling with dia is that right or you can still use labeling yeah. so why you cannot use it's it's a label free technique so yeah, but what, what restricts to use any labeling? 
I mean, in terms of uh, data acquisition and then processing, it should be pretty much the same as DDA. Why could not use labor? Your, your quantification would be multi. You couldn't de multiplex the quantification channels. Yeah. You could sprinkle in some isotopic protein standards and get absolute quantities for a subset of proteins. So you could incorporate labels in that manner. So you could still play with isotopes with the BIA. Yeah. You do protein turnover dynamics, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs>